Do you find yourself asking why year after year we get hyped for the new instalment of a blockbuster shooter franchise only to lose interest and abandon the game after a few months or even weeks? Almost every one of these games has failed to engage players with missing features, copy placed gameplay mechanics and unplayable releases. Meanwhile, indie games and mods made by just a handful of developers with little to no cash backing consistently produce fun shooting games with multiplayer numbers competing with AAA studios, sometimes by simply copying and building on old releases of previously popular games. With the legendary prestige of these franchises and the thousand strong development teams supported by publishers worth billions, how is it possible that these games continuously suck? Every once in a while, we get a game that is so popular or so innovative that it changes the face of gaming. Fortnite is the best example of this in the last decade, where its battle royale game mode, free to play accessibility and microtransaction based business model pulled hundreds of millions of players and made Epic Games billions of dollars. The downside of this innovation and success is that other publishers copy elements from successful games trying to replicate the same profits. Unfortunately, this leads to a cloning effect where games from different franchises within the genre become more and more alike, homogenising the space. COD, Titanfall, Battlefield, Counter-Strike and even Fallout for some reason all jumped on the trend and made battle royale games or game modes, some being more successful than others. What inspired you to build a second Krusty Krab right next door to the original? Money! Now, the introduction of these battle royale experiences in these games isn't necessarily a bad thing on its own. But whichever way you look at it, they erode a franchise's identity and detract from the core gameplay loop, with less players choosing to play traditional game modes and devs allocating less resources for them in order to support the cloned features. Let's look at Titanfall and Apex Legends for example. Titanfall is easily one of the most interesting and innovative shooters we have ever had with its parkour and mech mechanics. Sure, Apex Legends is loved by many and definitely holds on its own, but we haven't had a true Titanfall game with a badass campaign and even better multiplayer since October of 2016, almost definitely a result of the amount of time and money dedicated to Apex Legends, a battle royale set in the Titanfall universe. With big publishers pushing profits and development timeframes like never before, it's inevitable that corners are cut. With its quality of life features that are core to the player experience, like scoreboards, server browsers and voice chat, that are the ones going first. I'm looking at you Battlefield 2042 and your legacy features. I mean, how can you say legacy features as a game developer? What makes it legacy? You think just because it's a new game, I suddenly don't want to choose the server I join, having done it that way in previous installments for over a decade? There's a reason I don't use your matchmaking system, it's because it sucks and it puts me in half empty games full of bots all the time. Sorry, ran over, but you get the point. Worse than cutting quality of life features is the buggy mess that these games so often release as. Again, take Battlefield 2042 as an example. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't play video games that lie to me. The release of this game was historically bad, leading to some entertaining memes if nothing else. Hit registration, performance, visual bugs, crashes, invincibility, connection problems, invisible walls, movement bugs, you name it, 2042 had it. It boggles my mind how EA could get away with this game from even a legal perspective, being such a fundamentally broken product. I mean, if you bought any other product that wasn't fit for purpose, you would either return it or sue the manufacturer. But not in gaming, you just have to come back in two or three years and by then it will be fixed and all nine people still playing it will say, wow, what an amazing job EA and DICE did fixing this game. The player experience is suffering over everything else with these aggressive development budgets and timeframes, but I'll bet there's enough time and money to drop a bunch of new skins in the item shop for the next update, which leads me on to the next point. No matter what shooting game you're playing, if it's made by a AAA publisher and released within the last five years, microtransactions will be plastered all over your in-game menus and will be an effectively essential part of the game. Yet another re game, Star Wars Battlefront 2, took aggressive microtransactions to the next level, with a pay-to-win system forcing players to purchase loot boxes to progress their standard gear and keep up with the competition, or even unlock the ability to play heroes for that matter, which, by the way, are locked behind an entirely separate non-transferable currency system. Someone crunched the numbers and found out it would take a mind-numbing 4,500 hours of gameplay to unlock all the game's content. Or, of course, you could pay a lump sum of $2,100 directly to EA's already fat wallet 
bearing in mind you first had to buy the standard edition of the game at $60. It's insane to think that EA and DICE signed off on this system altogether. I mean, do they think we're stupid or what? And to no one's surprise, the game was dead on arrival and EA abandoned it as soon as possible after removing the pay to win system in the hopes that nobody would remember the controversy. Spoiler alert, that didn't work. Skill based matchmaking sounds like a great idea in theory. Put players in lobbies based on skill so everyone has a better experience. The noobs can play as if they were born yesterday and the sweats can no life it, all happening on an even playing field. But we all know it doesn't really work like that in practice. We get longer matchmaking times, smurfing, less variety in matches, burnout, inconsistent lobbies and an overall reduction in fun. Some of my favourite gaming memories wouldn't be possible in SBMM lobbies today like farming kills in a lobby full of noobs and trying to kill the guy about to drop a moab and end the match. The system does not reward good performance, it actively punishes it by putting players in less enjoyable lobbies. This makes sense in competitive game modes where you would expect that to happen and everyone is tryharding equally, but in casual ones, well let's just say it's no wonder why smurfing is rampant in these games. Despite its glaring issues and community backlash, developers still force SBMM onto players in modern games as a low effort one size fits all approach to matchmaking in an attempt to retain as many players as possible and keep harvesting their cash through microtransactions. Let's be real, we all play the campaign maybe a few times tops, it's the multiplayer we stick around for right? Well yes, but that doesn't diminish the importance of campaigns to the point where they should be outright omitted in some games, looking at you again Battlefield 2042, and for those games which still have campaigns, the quality is nothing short of pathetic. The Modern Warfare 3 reboot is a great example of this. Reused assets, copy placed missions, lack of content, cringe voice lines, dumb story decisions and boring environments. It's clearly a bottom of the barrel thought with minimal effort put into it. The publishers probably said, just make sure it has a campaign that milks all the good characters and storylines from previous games and left it at that to get into their private jets on their way to a certain somebody's private island. Comparing Modern Warfare 3 Reboot's campaign with the original Modern Warfare 2's with its deep compelling storyline, memorable characters, varied missions and cinematic experience makes it look like a low effort school project made by some kids messing about with modding for the first time. What I really don't understand is the financial aspect of producing such a bad campaign. I know for a fact people are still buying copies of the original Modern Warfare 2 exclusively to play the campaign for the first time and see what all the hype's about, or even just to re-experience it nearly a decade and a half after release. Surely this proves that there is still money to be made here. I've left this section till last as it's probably more PC focused, although it definitely does affect consoles. Optimization is becoming a joke on PC. You could have the most insane PC build known to man and you would still not be guaranteed a smooth experience. Getting a stable frame rate requires possibly hours of tweaking settings, watching YouTube guides and finding and testing obscure Reddit posts. In a competitive shooter a stable frame rate is of the utmost importance. Too many times I'm midway through a gunfight and an explosion happens near me causing a huge frame drop which then gets me killed. For me personally it's one of the top reasons why I would stop playing a game and both Warzone and 2042 fell big time in this category. And if you're wondering no I don't have a shit PC. Graphics are improving, we have higher resolution textures, computationally expensive lighting effects, dynamic weather systems and better animations, all mainly for marketing reasons let's be real, leading to massive file sizes. Now yes this is more of a nitpick but I think it's an issue that flies under the radar a little. These modern games take up tons of storage space, especially with consoles where you can't easily expand your internal storage space. Modern Warfare 3 has a file size of over 200 gigabytes and an Xbox Series S can have as little as 360 gigabytes of usable storage space. That's over 55% of your total storage space for a single game. If for some incomprehensible reason you also wanted to install Battlefield 2042, expect to be left with only 20% of your storage left. Enough for probably Roblox or something like that. If this isn't bad enough for you, using the average UK download speed, this download will take you about 10 hours just for these two games. It wasn't long ago that you could fit an entire game on a disc, you simply chucked it in the console and the game just worked. There was no download and install process and it certainly didn't take 10 hours. Hopefully the points I raised resonated with you because ultimately we as the consumer have ourselves to blame for these games sucking. We continuously fork over our hard earned cash for the same garbage 
year in, year out, expecting change. It's delusional, and it's time we as consumers stood our ground and didn't cave to the flashy marketing campaigns, corporate buzzwords and clueless mainstream reviewers. We know it can be better, the evidence is sitting in cases on our shelves or in our game libraries and has been for years. I'd like to take a moment to thank you for your time watching this video. I really appreciate your viewership, especially as you made it this far in the video. Leave a like if you enjoyed, subscribe for more of the same. I'm trying to hit a thousand subscribers and it would really mean the world to me if I could achieve that. Thanks again and I'll catch you later.